Do you want to get started with Linux? Have you started installing Fedora, CentOS, or Red Hat? If you want to learn more, this is the presentation for you to be able to jump into so we can learn more about it. Let's jump on in. So first off, my name is Jay Scar. We're going to go through and cover what and how to get the free developer license from RHEL to harness the power of the enterprise in our home labs. So who's this talk for? Folks who are just getting started with Linux, folks who are beginning, someone who's just started playing with it. If you want to play with Fedora, CentOS, Rocky, or Alma, uh, anything like Red Hat, anything that's RPM based, this is what this presentation is for. Uh, anybody who wants to get a job as a Linux system administrator, this is for you. So there are many different ways to go through and uh, set up to be able to get up and running with Linux. The thing is that there's more than one way of doing things. So there's always more than one way. So just, just the way that it's worked well for me, this may or may not work well for you. And if you've been using Linux for a while, this is going to be a lot of basic information that's been covered before. So with that, we just want to make sure there's no one perfect way. There's multiple ways. And let's jump right on in for today. So staying relevant in your home lab. So I'm going to give a little bit about the agenda, about what we're going to go through and cover today. So I'll cover a little bit about my background, steps for success in building yourself a home lab, which is a pretty big deal. So these are some of the things that I found out while I was doing my first job as a Linux system administrator. We've got a free developer rel license, download rel, create a bootable thumb drive, first rel install, register rel, update install software, and set up virtual machines, as well as current hardware suggestions. And then some resources at the end. You can go through and get the presentation for this. The PowerPoint is on my website, which is here. So first off, my name is Joshua Laskar. I go by Jscar Hawk Online when it comes to sysadmin work. Uh, you can find my website here at jscarhawk.github.io. So I'm a senior technical account manager for Red Hat. I am a hacker, podcaster, a maker, a 3D printer. Love taking care of that. In the background, I've got my, uh, th my Prusa uh, M3S, or I've got my Prusa printer. Uh, this is my third uh, different printer that I've picked up. I'm a hardware geek. Love an open source hardware and software and like to be able to vote with my wallet when it comes to supporting different projects like that. I have a few Raspberry Pis. I'm also a father of three boys and a husband, and I've got a very loving and patient wife that lets me buy a couple toys to make sure that I can go through and experiment and learn more and more about open source. And this has been my passion. So let's jump in. How did I go through and get here? Well, I came from a construction background. I worked in my family owned business making custom cabinets and countertops. And I did that for 14 years while in the nights studying and playing with Linux. I went to DEF CON, I wrote blogs, I studied for the A+, the Security+, and applied to sysadmin jobs. I also helped start a hackerspace and started attending a local Linux user group. In the aftermath of 20, uh, two, or 2008, the recession hit and people stopped spending money on home upgrades. I had a wife and I had a kid. Now I couldn't make rent, so I had to make the jump and find other work. Using connections I made while networking at the Linux user group, I was able to find my first Linux sysadmin job. So my first job, I thought it was going to be amazing. No problems whatsoever. Well, I found out that there was no documentation, that there was no network diagrams, that there was no configurations of any of the machines, no consistency with the machines that are installed from one to another, and best of all, I had no internet connection. My manager went through and said that he hired professionals to figure out the hard stuff, and that's why he had hired me. When the previous sysadmin who was there told me it would take three days to have a machine ready for a new developer. So, hey, at least we've got a baseline. Now we can go through and make it better. So these are the steps for success that I have found. And this is for your first Linux sysadmin job and for you running the same things at home for your own home lab. So thankfully, from when the uh, the sysadmin said that it took him three days to go through and get things up and running, I found out that by the time I left that job, we could have a new machine ready in 15 minutes as a developer was walking in the door. Uh, I could take a high schooler and send them through our training course in two weeks, 
and then be able to hand them the lab guide that they could rebuild the entire lab, which was three different networks and over 240 plus machines from scratch in just three days. So these are the steps for success. First off, you've got to document your process via an SOP, a standard operating procedure as an example. You can create your network map. If you don't have something to start off with, you have no idea if you've uh, gotten to that end state, but if you never plan, you never know if you've gotten there. And when it comes to documentation, you have to have something to start with. So just take the minute, do it now. And the free tool that you can go through and use with this is called draw.io. You can download it. You can use it free online. It's much like Visio, but it's free. So next thing is that you want to version control your documentation. Whether it's like a Google Drive or a CryptPad, you can go through and look at the history, or if you're better yet, being able to put that up to a, a central repository to where you check it in with version commit numbers. Or go even simpler, date and time when you went through and updated the lab manual last. Then you wanna start automating your setup. You don't wanna to have to do this by hand every single time. You can learn yourself a system like Ansible, like Puppet, or other scripting languages that you can get yourself up and running to automate the boring tasks. Then you wanna utilize your resources. This is important because if you're a student or if you're somebody who's in an underprivileged area, you can go through and have more resources versus other folks. If you are a student, you can go through and get discounted uh, options for when you go sign up for training, like a cloud guru, or if your, uh, your employer goes through and already has like LinkedIn training, Find out what resources that you have and utilize those to the best of your ability. And you want to share what you're working on. It's great that you're working on something, but if you never talk about it, nobody ever knows. So blog about it, do videos about it, write documentation, and then talk to other people about it. This is important because then you can find out, hey, here's the troubleshooting steps that I'm at, or if you post it online, maybe somebody else had the same issue and now you've helped them resolve their issue. Or better yet, they're stuck and now somebody else can come help you. It's, it's a definitely win-win situation here. Now the bonus things that you can go through and do a little bit later on is logging all the things, turning and making a syslog server to where you can point all of your different home labs to. If you collect logs, if you collect audit logs, if you collect networking logs, if you, if you capture network capture packets, this is only going to help you in the long run. So the more you can log, the better off you are. And, get from being reactive when it comes to IT to being proactive. And what that means is instead of waiting till something breaks, be aware, hey, that hard drive, that spinning hard drive, that's the, the old rust drive before SSDs that you've been using in your lab has been acting up. You can see that from looking at the smart logs, which throws an error inside of your system. So check those logs and it's gonna help you Make sure, hey, something's not acting right. And you'll be able to go from, oh, my drive died versus I should probably go buy a replacement drive and get my data off of there before it becomes inaccessible. That's an example of from going from reactive to proactive. A great way, a great book to utilize and check this out would be the Phoenix, uh, the Phoenix Project for your operator side of the house or your sysadmins. If you're more of a developer side of the house, you can check out the Unicorn Project. It basically explains a story of what most corporate IT looks like, and then it shows you here are the better ways to start using DevOps to be able to document what you're doing, help that around your organization, and create that community to be able to make sure that you're checking things in and that you're working together. It's a process. And it's a wonderful process and you've got to work with other people to get started. So with that, let's jump into, hopefully you're going through and you are starting to build a home lab. If not, here's a couple ways for you to be able to get started. If you want to be able to go through and build it, there are uh, old desktops that you can go through and use. You can use a laptop. You have lots of different options here. So let's get started with the why you'd want to go through and, uh, find out what operating system that you actually want to base your home lab off of. And in my use case, I went through and decided to choose Red Hat. And the reasons for that was because when you get the Red Hat subscription, which mm -hmm. is absolutely free, you can go through and get the software repositories, uh, which are the same ones that the enterprise customers get access to. 
So with that, you can get the software repositories. You can go through and get the security patches the same time frame as enterprise level folks. You can get access to the customer portal. I wish I would have known about this because it has so many answers to so many of the common questions and issues that are out there. It's incredible. It's a resource, talking about those resources from a couple slides ago, it's one of the best resources that you have and it's absolutely free. Then you also have access to Red Hat Insights. It is an optional thing to be able to hook up. You can go through and check blocks when you're going through and installing and registering your machine and it will actually give you information of your patch cycle, if there are any vulnerabilities that are currently up on that or vulnerable packages. It's a great extra service that you can install doesn't cost anything. If you're interested, let me know in the comments below and I will do a, a tutorial on how to get that up and running. And finally, there's also hardening guides to help you with your compliance needs. For home, you may not need this, but if you're practicing to go into an industry, there may be PCI compliance or HIPAA compliance, or you may have to be hardening and stigging things if you're going to go work for a government. So, these are all the options why I choose to go through and base my home labs on Red Hat Enterprise Linux, or RHEL for short. So to get started, you just need to go to developers.redhat.com slash products slash RHEL slash download. You can use the QR code here. I've also got the link to it here at the bottom of the screen. And we've had this for about three or four years now of time of recording, which is April 19th of 2023. Uh, so you can... There are lots of different questions out there. We're constantly adding to the FAQ, so check out the links below for you to be able to get more information there. To go through and create an account, it costs you nothing. You go through and set, you go to access.redhat.com, you're gonna sign up for a brand new account. To get yourself started, you're gonna fill out the form. So name, mailing address, you're gonna go through and then verify your email. So we have to have you go through, jump in. So in this case, I set up an account and sent it to my Proton Mail account. I click the button that says verify email, and then you're golden. From there, you need to go set up your profile. So you're gonna go access.redhat.com. You're gonna set your username, password. You're gonna set up your profile, and then you're gonna hit that submit button. From there, you're gonna read and accept the OSA, which is our open source agreement. And it's kind of like a EULA, but it's not that hard to go through and read. It's all in plain English, so go check it out so you know the rules, what, uh, what you have to go through and apply by when it comes to the machines, or being able to get the, uh, the subscription. You do get 16 licenses for free for you to be able to use per email address. So that's why we're trying to get this all signed up. So at this point, your account's all hooked up. That costs you nothing. You can now jump in to get the downloads. So on access.redhat.com, in the type, top left hand corner, there is the downloads button. If you click on that, then you can choose what product that you want to download. In this case, we're going to hit Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Then we're going to go through and click the download button for the ISO. ISO is the thing that you'll end up burning to a thumb drive or to a DVD or CD. If you want to go through and uh, change the different version, there is the drop down menu to go from version 9 to version 8 to version 7, etc. So after you hit that download button, you can then go check your subscriptions and you need to flip this box, uh, which is enable simple content access for Red Hat subscription management. This will make sure when you get ready to register any of your virtual machines or your physical machines, it automatically knows if you're logging in with the username and you're logging in with the password, add it to this account. Otherwise you'll have heartache on trying to get this accepted. So make sure this button is clicked to the enabled part. Now we're going to go through and since we've started our download onto our machine, now we need to go through and pick up a piece of burning software called Etcher. It's made by Belena. You can go through and uh, download this for Mac, Windows, or Linux. And the great thing is, is that you can pretty much run it from anywhere. And it's super straightforward. This is all that you need. Plug in that spare thumb drive into your computer. Uh, everything that's going to be on this thumb drive is going to be erased, so make sure you're either starting with the new one or that you've copied your important data files off. Once you plug it in, you can then click the first uh, hexagon here with the plus, which means select your image or your ISO that you want to burn. We're gonna then going to surf over to wherever we downloaded our ISO, go ahead and click on it, and then the next thing is we're going to choose the thumb drive. 
The great part about Etcher is that it's going to select thumb drives and not your internal hard drive or SSD or NVMe. It makes it simpler to where it just hides those. It's only going to say, here's the thumb drive, which is great. Uh, after you've gone through and selected your ISO, you've selected your thumb drive, go ahead and hit the flash button. And this will take a couple minutes. Not only will it go through and flash it onto the thumb drive, but then it's going to do a verification to make sure that everything came over correctly. Now, if for whatever reason you get to this screen and it says flash completed or flash incomplete, there are some steps in troubleshooting that we can go through and do on making sure that if you've downloaded an ISO, there's either an MD5 or a SHA-1 sum that you can go through and compare to make sure the whole ISO file got downloaded correctly. If you have issues with that, put it in the comments below. I'd be happy to help you there. Otherwise, you can also follow the instructions for the download because it has it on each one of those ISOs that are out there as well. So assuming everything went well and the flash completed, we can then go through and let's talk about the first time setup. If we're going in and then going to plug in that thumb drive, I'm plugging it into this Intel NUC that was brand new wiped and set up for this purpose, which is great. And we're pretty much said and done. Once we've plugged it in, we press the power button and then we're going to select uh, whatever our boot menu option is. In this case, you can actually see that I took tape and I've uh, put F12 as my boot. Just because that's my uh, boot selection option doesn't mean that that's your boot selection option for your hard drive, for your machine, or for your system. In this case, if I grab another machine, i.e. this HP that I've got here, this HP needs F9 to boot instead. I go through and I like to mark which uh, which uh, devices use which boot selection when you're getting up and running. So put that on there, it makes it easier to run later on. So when it comes to hardware, you can go through reset your BIOS by default so you know exactly what is or is not enabled. You want to enable booting from USB and under your performance and processor settings, there's gonna be something about hyper-threading enabled and virtualization technology enabled. This is gonna have a little bit of a different name if you're on AMD versus Intel, but the core of the words that you're looking for are the virtualization technology. If you can't find that, Google your machine BIOS settings virtualization. Because for in my use case, the Intel NUC actually had it hidden underneath another submenu. So after you've gone through and enabled the hypervisor uh, or the hyper threading and the virtualization technology, then you want to go underneath the boot security settings. and. I'm assuming that you're just getting started in Linux, so a lot of this may be new terms. If you have questions, let me know in the comments as well. Otherwise, make sure underneath the security and boot settings that secure boot is disabled. Then you want to go UEFI boot is disabled as well. And lastly, legacy boot is enabled. This is going to make sure that you can get up and running because I have no idea how new or how old your hardware is that you're trying to install RHEL onto. And this is a good rule of thumb for installing almost any Linux. You can absolutely go more secure here, but I'm going to assume that if you're trying to go more secure, you're uh, more familiar with Linux. And this is something that we can learn more about later on in other sessions. So after we've gone through and got that up and started, we want to... So once we boot it up into the thumb drive, we have these selections here where we're going to go through and select our uh, language, which is English. From here, we're going to go through and set our root password, and we're going to set something decent here, and then we're going to do the same for the verification. Now, be, by default, RHEL 9 actually has the root account locked to where you can't get into it via SSH, which is a good security move. So the next step is going through and making an account that I can log in or SSH to. I like to call it LabBot just because you can go through and call it a uh, backdoor or you could call it uh, back admin or whatever else. Create yourself a username and a password. Make sure to check the box that it has administrative access. Then choose your time and date. I'm on the West Coast, so I chose LA. And then we're going to go into the installation. This is going... I'm going to the custom side because I need to erase what I had installed on the old drive. So I'm going to select this, check the box that says erase everything old off the drive, and hit OK. 
Now, this is a tip and trick that I have gone through and done. So while I say add it and customize it, that's great. If you're running RHEL 9, delete the slash home and add all the space that you can to the slash, which means we're adding as much spare space to the root drive. Because if you're going to use this as a virtualization machine or a logging machine, you want as much space on the slash or the root home drive as you possibly can. Other folks go through and change that. That's another argument for another day. This is my recommendation. And then I just rounded up my swap. Swap is equal to your page file on Windows, which has to do with how you sleep and hibernate with Linux. So once we press done, it's going to go through and do those configurations. At this point, the only other thing that we need to do is go in and name the machine. I like to go through and pick something. I treat my machines like cattle, not pets. So I went and picked uh, random bird names here and then put a number after the end of it. Applied it and then pressed done. And then from there, it'll start installing, which is pretty straightforward. Uh, this installation process takes about five minutes or so, uh, five to 10 minutes, depending on the speed of your thumb drive and what you're writing to. If you're writing to an SSD, it's going to be slower than writing to an MVME drive. But if you are installing it onto a spinning hard drive, it's going to take a lot longer. So instead of waiting here through this entire process of it installing, which takes about five or seven minutes, I'm going to skip ahead here and go to our next slide. So from there, we're going to set up for our first boot next. And that first boot, we're able to go through and uh, see it come up. It's going to take it a few minutes because anytime that you first brand new install a Linux operating system, it's going to have to scan through all of the RAM that's available. So if you have a lot of RAM, it's going to take a couple minutes. If you have less RAM, okay, that's fine. So it now finally comes up to the first login screen. We're going to go ahead and grab our mouse, move on over and click onto the lab bot. We're going to type in our password. And then from there, this is our first time logging in. So it's going to throw the Welcome to GNOME. If you've never used it before, why don't you take the tour? Then from here, you can hit get the overview. You can make your own apps. You can have virtual workspaces. If you're on a laptop, you can swipe up, down, left, right, and have different means. There are five or six different ways to register a RHEL box. This is the easiest way from the pop-down menu. We can go hit register system. Then you can go grab your login information for your uh, same account that you made earlier to log into Red Hat. In this case, I set up a brand new system and a brand new account just for this. So once we go through, I'll start typing that in here. And all I need is my username and then my password. So once this is done here, typing this in, we only need to do the login and password. We don't need to fill in the organization section. So once we've got step one done, great. And then after that, we type in the password. And then as soon as that's done, we can hit the great big blue register button. Now, once you're going through and registering this, this will take a few minutes, which is going to go through and enable your repositories for you to be able to pull patches and updates. If we were to try to do a yum update or yum upgrade, which says, hey, go grab all the updates for this operating system and pull it down, it would have failed because we didn't register first. So for you to get access to the repositories, you need to go through and enable that. So now that we have repository access, we're going to do exactly that. Now we're going to tell it to pull those packages. So we're going to type in sudo, which elevates our privileges. Yum is our package manager. And then update is going to say update all these packages. The tack Y means yes, I accept all of the package upgrades and the GPG key saying that this is a verified repository. Again, if you're going through and trying to make a more secure situation, uh, drop the tack Y and then you can look through to do the comparison for that GPG key to be compared to where you're actually getting that from the source. But that's going fairly quickly here. We can go through and get all the keys imported because we did the tack why it's automatically doing that. And then from there, it'll say, okay, we've downloaded these. Now we're gonna upgrade each one of these in place. 
and then it'll do a cleanup script. So this will take a few minutes. Uh, this is not set up to automatically update to start with. Uh, that is something that we can absolutely cover in a future video on how to go through and do. But I always find it a good step process as a sysadmin. As soon as you've installed an OS, go patch and update it to make sure that you are on the latest and greatest. So right now, the other thing is on the, uh, on the far left-hand side, you can see all the upgrading uh, messages. You don't see any errors. You don't see any warnings. So this is acting just fine and dandy. No issues whatsoever. We'll give it about another 30 seconds here to grab more packages. Do, 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 do. Sweet. It's running the cleanup, running the scriptlets. It, it looks like we got a new kernel, so we can go through and reboot to have that go through and be applied. Da, da, da. And it should come back and say completed here in just a second. Do, 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 do. So uh, at this point, you could go grab yourself a cup of coffee when you do the uh, update and upgrade. Um, and, or just update for yum. Just like when you go through to install the box, it's done in less than 10 minutes. So now it says completed, we're good to go. It's time to go ahead and reboot. So upon the reboot, we can go through and let's go to our next section. Rebooting the, the Intel NUC. Just doing the little loading. And it'll bring us back to our login menu. Just like that. Grab your mouse, go ahead and go on over, log yourself in. And once you've got yourself logged in, we should already be up and running. Looks like the same video replayed itself. Cool. So if you've gone through and worked with Linux before, this is not going to be new news to you, but there is something out there for the new folks called Cockpit. And it is an awesome piece of software that you can go through and install that gives you a lot of control. Instead of using the terminal, you can go through and use a lot of the Linux sysadmin work as a GUI that's just running as a web page, which is awesome. So you can find this information by scanning the QR code or go to cockpit-project.org. And you can install it on every type of Linux that's out there, which is awesome. So you can go through, go to the site, pick the Linux that you're going through installing on. Since we're talking about RHEL today, the straightforward answer is, uh, well, you can install Cockpit up to, or all, going all the way back to version 7 of RHEL. Uh, and we're going to choose to install for RHEL 9. We're going to do a sudo yum install Cockpit. And then we're going to enable that service with sudo systemctl enable tac tac now cockpit.socket. Now just to break down what this command does, for the first install, it says sudo yum install cockpit. So sudo is saying I'm going from my user to an admin user. And then yum is our package repository saying this is how we want to go through and install something. And that package is called cockpit. On the enable cockpit, there is a sudo. So again, we're elevating our privileges to an admin. And then systemctl. This is our scheduling system or our timing system. There's a lot more to this, but for now, let's just say that this is how you go through and turn a service on or off. And that's exactly what we're telling it to do next is we're going to enable the service and then the tac tac now, the two negative signs now is saying we are going to start it right this very second. And the service name is called cockpit.socket. So from here, you can go through, open any browser that you want to, uh, whether that's on the machine that you're going through and working off of or from a remote machine. So if you're going to do it on the machine that you're working from, you can go localhost colon 9090. You could also do the IP address from anything else that's on your network colon 9090 and log in. So super sweet way to be able to go through and do Linux sys admin work on your machine. With that, this is the cockpit overview. This is how you get your start. Uh, right now, one of the important things is this little icon up here says that you are just logged in as a user. If we want to go through and do any changes, we need to go through and click that big old blue button that says admin access. 
and then it's going to have us enter in our password to be able to switch to the admin mode. Now you can see in the top corner, it's now logged in with administrator access. From there, we're going to go over to the applications and we're going to click the machines and we're going to click the install button. If you want to automate this later on, you can actually just go sudo yum install libvirt cockpit cockpit dash machines tack y and then to enable the services that you need it's system ctl enable libvirt d tack tack now so now this is installed we can go on and move to the next tab which is setting up virtual machines and once you've got the virtual machine option on the top of the page you'll also see the storage pools and network that's here once you've gone through and click, click that, you want to go through and create a new storage pool called default, all lowercase, and the target path is going to be var or slash var slash lib slash libvirt. Long story short, this is where most of the Linux virtual machines live. There's a couple different programs out there that you can use to interface with this, including box, boxes, virtual machine. Um, there's also... KVM and QEMU, lots of different ones use it. So this is the path that we want to point it to. Next, we want to go over to networking and we want to talk about if we were want to bridge or not to bridge in this situation. So bridging is making sure that you can have your virtual machines talk to your entire network. So in this case, I like to go through and do a bridge if it is a uh, machine that's sitting in the corner with an ethernet jack that's plugged in, which is great. Uh, if it's a laptop, I may not suggest going through and doing a bridge. So with that, let's hit that network bridge button. It's just going to go with the default name, which is bridge zero. We're going to click the Ethernet, which is the EN named device. And then the virtual bridge, which is the VI something something VR. And we're going to blend those two together by clicking the apply button. So with those two prerequisites out of the way, let's spin up our first VM. And there's another tool that we can actually install with pre-made virtual machines, which is great. So to install that, you're going to go sudo yum install libguestfs-tools and libguestfs. Uh, there are links to a lot more of this information in the presentation that will be linked. But once we've gone through and done that, we can actually do a vert builder tack tack list. And it'll show all these other virtual machines that have already been pre-built by the community, which is kind of awesome. So we could grab a CentOS 8 build as an example, and then we want to customize it a bit for our use case. So we're going to go sudo vert builder CentOS 8 tack O for output name, which is going to be called rsyslog-server.qcow2, and the format is going to be qcow2, tack tack update, host name to rsyslog1, tack tack home or, or root password, then we're going to set the password, colon, all one word here, and then tack tack size, 20G for gigabyte. To break this down, the program that we're running, as first we're running as a administrator, we're running the program called vert builder, and we're calling out the image that we're wanting to copy. The output name, we're going to create an rsys log server, which is something to be able to gather all of the logs and put them in one place. And the .qcow2 is a file format. If you've worked with any other virtualization before, if you're familiar with VMware, they have like VDIs or VHDs. This is the one that's used most commonly with Linux, which is called qcow2. And then the tac tac update means that, hey, this is a couple of the customizations that I want to do to this pre-made image. I want to change the host name to be rsyslog1, set that root password so I can get in. Uh, quick tip here, don't go through and use special characters now in this script because it'll go through and cause you issues. Make it a long secure password, that's fine, but just not any special characters. And then tac tac size is telling you I want to grow the hard drive space by 20 gigabytes. From there, that's the pre-built images. If you want to go through and use more of your Red Hat Enterprise Linux free developer licenses, you can actually download pre-made RHEL KVM images. KVM, QCOW2, same difference. So you can go back to that access.redhat.com, go back to the products, go back to the downloads, and you can scroll on down and either get yourself the RHEL 8 image, 
RHEL 9 image. And the cool thing is instead of the ISO being like 8 gigs or 11 gigs if uh, it's RHEL 8, the KVM images are like 900 megabytes or 700 megabytes. They're a lot smaller, which is great. So to stage your RHEL images, you want to go through and move them to slash var slash lib slash libvert slash images. And then we're going to go through and set that root password and inject RSSH key into the image. So in this case, we're going to do move these uh, files that you've gone through and downloaded. And in the case of uh, going through and downloading the RHEL 9 base QCOW image, this is the command with sudo mv, which is move. The tilde key means home. So we're going to move from my home downloads RHEL 9 base QCOW 2 image space slash, which means that we're now sending it to var lib libvert images. From there, we can cd down into that, which cd means change directory. So then we can do then do an ls and see all the listing of our different uh, machines that we've gone through and moved there. Now we're going to do the vert customize tack a rel9 tack base dot qcow2. So we're, this is the name of the, uh, the file that we're going to go through and modify. tack tack password space password colon. Again, do a long username or a long password here. Don't do any special characters yet. And then tack tack uninstall cloud in it. The cool thing is about the QCOW2 images or the KVM images that are provided by Red Hat is that they're ready to be able to deploy anywhere, including up to cloud providers. So cloud in it is a package that'll say, hey, here are the things that I'll go through and interact with my other devices that are out there, my other service providers that are out there. But that means that it'll randomly grab a new IP address each time. We want to go through and set this up for our home lab. So we're going to uninstall the cloud in it. So we've got more control over how we set up our IAP addresses instead of it looking like it's going to a cloud provider. From there, you can go through and import your images back on the cockpit side of the house. So we're back out of the terminal, into cockpit, grab it, grab your names, go rel9, rel8. Then you can go through and set up your uh, paths to where you have those KVM images. Again, var, lib, libvert images. And then if you're talking about the rel9 or the rel8, this is how you get started. You can then also go through and set up your RAM here and select how much RAM. From there, you can go through and now once you're up and running for the first time, it does set up a default private network to start with. Let the machine start up for the first time. You can then tell it to go shut back down and then move that to using our bridge interface instead. So how you go through and do that is you click that edit button. You can click the pop-up window underneath the interface, choose bridge to LAN source is bridge zero. And then uh, the model you can just leave as default and save and boot up your machine. And from that, you are ready to go. You can now go through and create rel seven or, or rel eight, rel nine, CentOS eight or whatever virtual machines. You can do the same process across the board. From there, there's a couple different hardware suggestions out there that I can go through and say. If you want to install other things that are uh, Red Hat based, when it comes to platform and or making virtualization, uh, you need a minimum of four cores. Now, cores and threads, there are two different things there. Uh, cores are typically the physical device versus threads are when they're virtually cut in half to where you can get more virtual cores going on. So the vCPU that you see on the OpenShift side Right, it's just out of the picture a little bit, but there's an OpenShift Snow or SNO option, or there's the platform and virtualization side. Uh, we'll talk about OpenShift at another point in time, and I've actually updated my system requirements and or suggestions on my site at the jscar-hawk.github.io or jscar-hawk.com. And I've got my suggestions on whatever I've gone through and build in the past, what I would suggest for this year and or future builds. So from that, what size of server do you go through and you need? Well, that's a larger subject and we'll leave that for the next video. So with that, I wanna thank you for your time and I hope that you like, you subscribe, and if you have any questions, please do go through and put them into the comments below. There are a couple of resources that you can go through and do is go check out more RHEL content on the Red Hat Enterprise Linux channel. You can check out more on my channel that I'll be going through and doing just common Linux system administration items. 
and there are more resources, including uh, if you're looking for different Linux podcasts, the Linux Gamecast, not safe for work, but fantastic show. The Tux Digital Destination folks are a fantastic group of people who get together talking about Linux all the time. And then there's also the Jupiter Broadcasting folks with Linux Unplugged, the self-hosted program and such. You've also got other folks on when it comes to Linux hardware advice. You've got Level 1 Techs. Uh, this guy goes deep diving into hardware like nobody's business, going from uh, the home all the way deep into the enterprise side of the house. Uh, there's also Techno Tim, who's done a little bit of dabbling between hardware and also when it comes to Kubernetes. If you're looking for Raspberry Pi and Ansible advice, go check out Jeff Gerling's channel. It is fantastic and well worth the subscription. If you're an MSP or looking to be able to do more enterprise level software and in your home, Lawrence Lab Systems is fan freaking tastic. Uh, it's actually his resource that I went through and got turned on to the draw.io for network diagramming. So well worth your time, well worth the effort. And with that, if you have any questions, you can always go through, get the slides later on. Uh, you can go to my ch uh, channel here, see them in the description or go to my site. And with that, I hope you have an absolutely fantastic day.